Where else would Tim's story begin but in a smoky bar in Manhattan? Sticky floors and the aroma of stale beer provided the perfect setting for a romantic first meeting. Tim's dad, also named Tim, was on stage playing lead guitar with his band Full Circle. As he strummed his Stratocaster viciously, his gaze found that of Patty's, Tim's mother-to-be. The pair connected over a shared love of music and would start dating. With Tim Senior's dream of becoming a successful musician, the pair would often travel from town to town, following the tour of his band as they endeavoured to make it big. It was the mid-70s and the pair, both in their early 20s, had found something special in one another, and their fledgling relationship was flourishing, with marriage following soon after. But it was a full decade after they had originally tied the knot that the pair were expecting their first child together. In the midst of Ronald Reagan being inaugurated, We Are the World being released, and the Unabomber claiming his first victim, Timothy J. Dillon was born on January 22, 1985. Tim once wrote about growing up, I'll be honest about my shit, I spent time in crack houses and got into drugs, I started doing blow at 13 and was a closet homosexual, my mum is schizophrenic, that's why I'm like this, now I want to know why everyone else is like that. Poor Tim, growing up as an only child was a paradoxical experience. Brought up in Island Park in a middle class suburb, he had a seemingly normal family home environment with both parents present. His dad worked as a salesman, still playing with his band in local bars on weekends. His mother was a swimming instructor, sometimes giving private lessons in the pool that they had in the family home. Yet he also had feelings of being quite isolated in his upbringing, as without siblings there was no one with whom to really share his day to day life coupled with the fact that his parents' relationship had become turbulent. So my, my family went to Disney World, and this was really right before things fell apart. Things were being held together. I mean, this was really, when you look back, it's really after things fell apart, but before, you know, the consequences of that. It's what it really is. They were at the, the, the table at the Grand Floridian character breakfast, and I remember it, and I remember my father shoving what, I imagine was a competently cooked egg in his mouth because it is a nice hotel. And I remember he looked at my mother and he goes, will you shut the fuck up so these things will come over here? My mother and father hated each other with passion. Young Tim would observe the tense interactions of the loveless marriage. This would shape the way he viewed relationships thereafter. But a marriage Tim did admire was his grandparents. His grandfather was a deeply religious Irish immigrant who worked his way up from nothing as a carpenter. With perseverance, he was able to build his own successful business, accumulating great wealth and building a beautiful home on the North Shore with ample gardens and tennis courts. Him and his wife were the patriarch of the family and admired within the community. Observing his grandparents' affluence had a marked effect on Tim. For him, there was a mystique to the idea of having money, a concept that seemed to draw him in. He was captivated by the lives of the wealthy and would often gaze in wonder at the oppressive mansions in the wealthy neighbourhoods, imagining what it would be like to live such a luxurious lifestyle. Tim saw fame as a means to achieve that level of wealth, as from a young age he had the ambition to be famous, once pointing at the TV and saying to his mum, I want to be on that. This would spur his parents on to sign six-year-old Tim up for acting classes and performance art. Before long, he was attending auditions, often with his mother for roles in theatres, commercials and movies. His acting career would start with promise, landing a role in a short sketch for Comedy Central, shortly followed by a part in Sesame Street for PBS. With this early success, Tim and his family started to believe a career in show business could be a realistic possibility. A second callback for a significant role would be pivotal for Tim's burgeoning career, but at the last hurdle the producers opted to go with another boy for the role. Tim and his mother sat in a diner afterwards feeling dejected. The optimism had been so high when they'd made the journey for the second audition, it seemed almost certain they'd achieve the outcome they'd hoped for. But the rejection had been emphatic, and by age 12 Tim's acting career would fizzle out. On the cusp of becoming a teenager, a couple of significant changes came on the back of Tim's show business rejection. His parents finally divorced after many unhappy years of marriage. My parents' divorce went on for two years because neither one of them could afford to get lawyers, so they had a mediator, and a mediator just comes to your house and your parents just argue at a dining room table over a collection of Beanie Babies or whatever the fuck they had. These fucking boomers had nothing. They had a few lamps. 
Aunt Gussie's table. I remember my mother said that. She goes, well, who's going to get Aunt Gussie's table? And I'm like, hi, I'm 13 and I'm about to embark on a decade of drug use. Could one of you maybe check in perhaps while we're dividing up a table that has a market value of at best $75? I'm a living organism that you both have created. So could potentially maybe you find the time to check in on how I'm doing while you divide up all the winnings of 20 years of, of, of having no college education and no financial planning, okay? And believing you could retire by collecting Hess trucks. Subsequently, his dad would move out and his mother would rent out the rooms in the house in order to keep up with the bills. The consequences of the changes were more than Tim could have anticipated. The new tenants in the house were men from the fringes of society, regularly dealing drugs under his mother's roof. Tim was exposed firsthand to another side of life which seemed new and exciting. It was only a matter of time before Tim crossed the line into this new world and started experimenting with the consumption of drugs. The subsequent years for Tim were spent in a haze of various drugs. Cannabis gradually developed into cocaine, pills were haphazardly sourced from the bathroom cabinet, and copious amounts of alcohol were consumed on the regular. Tim and his friends spent a lot of time at crack houses, which they found strangely fascinating. Here in this unpleasant yet strangely welcoming environment, they encountered all kinds of odd and remarkable characters, some of whom seemed to be almost magical in their eccentricity, their musings and their attitude to life and the world at large. Tim was naturally drawn to them and came to understand how these people lived and did their best to survive in the world. Eventually his parents decided this living situation wasn't the best environment for Tim and he moved into his dad's. During this time Tim would enter high school. His formative years of schooling were always secondary behind his acting aspirations, with him regularly being absent to attend auditions. But during his high school years, Tim had had a bit of a transformation, renowned for his sharp sense of humour and his fondness for recreational drugs, making him a fun character everyone wanted to be around. So much so, he was crowned homecoming king, a high note to an otherwise dark period. Dude, I remember the senior year I had some of the best, some of the most fun I ever had in my life. I remember senior summer... Hanging out with a even during senior summer, you started to see the people from your 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 school less and less. Mm -hmm. By the end of senior summer, you all kind of saying goodbyes, and it was time for everyone to go away to college. Except Tim Dillon, who went to Nassau Community College because he was a fucking loser. Uh, but it doesn't matter because I podcasted now with Alex Jones and Roseanne. Eat your heart out, bitches. Um, <laughs> just love. I go back to like give a speech at my school. I'm like. I've sat down with the greatest minds of our generation. I have spoken to the greatest minds, to the minds of people that have shaped our world. How did I do that? How did I do that? Well, I took drugs for a decade, developed what some would call latent schizophrenia, and then started, started to make connections with people that also had that disease but were far more successful than me. Okay, kids? So take the student loans and shove them up your ass. But that week when everyone was going to school, it was like, the, you know, August, whatever. You knew it was over. You could feel it. Even when people were like, no, nah, man, we're all, we're all going to be. And then, yes. You know what's funny? The first Thanksgiving uh, weekend, everyone comes back. That first Wednesday, it feels a little different. Maybe you're all still friends. You're all still hanging out, probably. Wednesday before Thanksgiving, like, when it's the next year, it's, like, sophomore year in, in college. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it's been one year. It's You see people, they're, like, strangers to you, and they were, like, your best friends. And, like, oh, my God, you we have we have nothing in common. After leaving high school, many of Tim's friends went away to other towns for college, but Tim opted to go to Nassau Community College on Long Island, with his standout moment being captain of the debate team where he won the first debate championship in the college's history. Tim's gift for off-the-cuff discussion would be a skill which would serve him well later on in life. After leaving college, Tim, still in the grips of a cocaine addiction, would enter the working world as an office printer salesman. Tim was no expert, but his advice was often driven more by friendly banter than technical knowledge. 
Shortly afterwards, Tim would become a mortgage broker, later describing himself and his colleagues as huckster cokeheads who would say anything to get customers to sign up for a predatory loan. I feel like I could not want a mortgage and yeah. then talk to you and be like, I just got a new mortgage. Like this guy. Here's Tim. the thing. I'm a fun guy to talk to uh -huh. and I'm going to call. Mm -hmm. And we're going to connect a little bit. You're going to follow up, too. And I'm going to follow up <laughs> yeah. because I got a bunch of folders on that desk. And I'm going to hit them uh -huh. once or twice a day. Yep. And I'm hoping that we can, you know, do business together. <laughs> and if it doesn't make sense, Tom, we part as friends. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that was my line. Uh -huh. you know, that was a line we all said. We said. And then, yeah. but you're trained to not accept... Yeah. No, like that's well, the thing. I wouldn't the really the good word guys. trained. Right. I'd, be, I'd be very loose with the training that we all received. Okay. Um, the training was a guy going, how about you make some fucking money? Right. And shutting his door. Yeah. And then literally a bunch of unemployable guys, some of whom had DWs whose mothers were dropping them off at the office, then got on phones and called people and said we were financial advisors. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This was during the subprime mortgage crisis, a multinational financial crisis which led to a severe economic recession, with millions losing their jobs and many businesses going bankrupt. But this didn't stop Tim as his passion for the finer things in life ended up with him selling himself a $6,000 subprime mortgage on a house he could never afford to keep. With bills piling up and massive debts accumulating, Tim did the only sensible thing. He abandoned the house for the mortgage company to reclaim it. Tim's next job took him to an open-top bus in New York as a tour guide, drawing on his natural ability to tell a captivating story. During his time, Tim shared a cramped apartment with a roommate, his salary and tips just about covering the rent. This couple on my tour bus, I go, what do you think of New York? They go, ah, ah. And they had the Disney shirts on, and they go, they go, to be honest, we're a little disappointed. We're going to take a Disney cruise. We've taken three of them. So we decided we were going to go to New York this time, but we, we, we don't really, we don't really, we don't really like New York. We, we, we actually were just talking about that we should have been on a Disney cruise or they said, or go to Disney World. And I go, well, why do you go to Disney World? They go, well, it's the best place in the, on earth. And I go, well, why? I know that that's kind of their logo or slogan or whatever, but tell me why. Tell me why it is. And they go, it's just great. They go, it's great. You can have so much fun. They go, it's all there. They go, it's all there, the guy said. And I go, what is there? Can you explain to me what is there? New York, we have some of the best museums, the best restaurants. We have Central Park. We have five boroughs. We have history, culture. We got all this shit. We got beaches. We got the Hudson River an hour. I mean, I met, you know, you know who did New York right, man? Fucking in shape. Scandinavians, man. They're like, yeah, they're like, we went, we took a train an hour out of the city. We went kayaking in the Hudson River. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know who doesn't do that? Americans. They don't do that. They don't fit in the kayak. Approaching his mid-twenties, Tim was still in the closet about his homosexuality. He'd never felt comfortable being his true self around his friends, so he kept up the pretense that he was straight and had dated a few women in his teens. I, have you I, ever had sex with a woman? I have, yeah. I've had sex with a few women on Long Island. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not a ton. It's about a handful. I mean, they're not... Yeah. How was that experience? It was fine. It wasn't great, but it wasn't like... I feel like... Part of that was them. Yeah. Part of that was Not them. being men. <laughs> well, part of that was them not being men, but also not being really good to make me forget I was gay. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. that's part of, I mean, obviously that's not all on them, but, like, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I, was, I was trying really hard to not be gay at the uh -huh. moment, and they made me feel like a faggot the whole time. <laughs> and I feel like... <laughs> There's, this is blame that can be shared. I'll take a lot of it. I'll take a serious amount of that blame. You think if they were better looking or more sexually attractive or sure. more feminine or less feminine, do you think would have? I don't know. It's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to really imagine them, but I feel like if they just, all of the things you mentioned. Yeah. You know, if they kind of made me feel like this was doable, maybe I, I wouldn't have had to just start having sex with men. Yeah. <laughs> 
But again, this is <laughs> the, everything, you know, all's well that ends well, I guess. Totally. Yeah. Just, it's all a journey. Yeah, you dodged. We would go to dinners usually because I didn't want to have sex with women. Uh We'd go to these very big dinners. You'd go to Broadway shows. Yeah, (laughs) no, we would go to like shows at concerts and like go to like these very large dinners so that afterwards nobody would want to have sex. They were Mm. these very Mm, so a lot of the women that dated me have had just the greatest meals of their life. I mean, truly, I mean, amazing. I mean, and that's basically sex for women. They want to be wine and wine. I've dated these women for months. I barely touched them, and they, I left that. Like they would be okay with it. Like. Yeah, and, and that's totally. why I understand. Like he's so traditional. Yes, mm-hmm. women that marry like gay men because like <laughs> they just go, I like having chocolate souffles, and, <laughs> you know, like barely getting touched. Instead, he would reach out on Craigslist to find other like-minded men with which to pursue his romantic endeavors. 2010 was a watershed moment for Tim. Watching several of his friends succumb to addiction, he chose a different path. He decided to give up on drugs and laid out a plan for himself towards a new dream, to make a name for himself as a stand-up comedian. Tim had a gift for comedy and he knew it. He'd test it out in small coffee houses and backstreet bars in the city, determined to perfect his craft and find out what worked. Soon it became apparent that the audiences loved his razor-sharp wit and he was quickly making a name for himself as a stand-up in New York. He would use the characters from his upbringing as subjects for his comedy, namely his mother who had provided Tim with lots of material over the years. I make fun of my mother all the time. You to know, her she, or, or about to her? To her, about her. If yeah. she was in better health, I'd bring her on stage. Um, she's funnier <laughs> than most people. Um, she's hilarious. I mean, she's just one of those people who's like, she's crazy. But here's the thing with schizophrenics. They don't have a filter. No. You know? no so that's kind filter. of fun yeah. with a schizophrenic. No she's filter. in a state-run institution. She's no longer auditioning for the world. Right. She's got things to say. Growing up, Tim's family may have joked about his mother's eccentricities, but it wasn't until much later when Tim was an adult that he found out she'd been living with schizophrenia. Although he had seen flashes of her strange behavior, he never realized the magnitude of it until the diagnosis. And in hindsight, he understood his childhood with a whole new clarity. After five years of working on the comedy circuit, Tim was beginning to make a name for himself. It was no surprise that after his appearance at the 2016 Just For Laughs Comedy Festival that everyone was talking about him. He seemed to be getting more and more work as his name circulated, and he was getting written about in mainstream publications such as Vulture and Rolling Stone who named Tim in the top 10 comedians you need to know list. There were setbacks along the way, a notable one being when Tim walked onto the set of Last Comic Standing and encountered one of his comedy heroes, Norm MacDonald, on the judging panel. Norm MacDonald, when I first did uh, (laughs) stand-up, I did a, what did I do? I did that dumb, uh, Last Comic Standing. He's now a fan of what I do, and he thinks I'm funny, and he said on Twitter, but he said to me, he's like, hey, he's like, how long long have you been doing stand-up? And I'm like, about four years. He's like, what are you doing here? He's like, it takes 10 years to be a comedian. So it was just like, ah. So it was crushed by Norm, who's great. Yeah. And I did a great set right before he told me that. So he was basically like, what the fuck are you doing? Determined to keep moving forward with his career, Tim set out with optimism to explore the landscape of the LA comedy scene. It was while there that he met a significant figure in his career, Ben Avery. I lived in Beverly Hills at the time in a very small oh, studio apartment because Katie worked over there at the time and I worked in a Chinese restaurant. That's cool. And I was a fucking like raging alcoholic, right? Oh, so you this is recent then? Yeah, this was uh, Two, three, three years, years ago, ago okay. about. Yeah. And uh, I got a message from the host of the show. It was like, hey, can you pick up this guy, uh, Tim? And he's staying at someone's house in... in uh, like West Hollywood. Mm. So I picked him up and drove him all the way to Chatterbox. That's forty, and, like 45 minutes, right? Yeah, 45 yeah. minutes there, 45 minutes back. So you get to know him pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, Was he less talkative back then? No, he, he was he's kind of the same guy. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, he's like, at the time, I guess he was like eight years in. You know, he had, you know, no specials, nothing like that. So he was just sort right. of... But I had heard of him. I knew I was like, oh, he's like the guy. Like, I was like, I've heard from everybody, he's fucking great. So I was kind of nervous to pick him up. Ben was raised in Texas in a middle-class, strict Christian household. He was a fan of comedy and tried his hand at stand-up, but it wasn't a natural fit. During these car rides, the pair would strike up a friendship and bond over their love of comedy. 
Before long, Ben had set up a little film studio in his garage and the two of them were making comedy sketches. With Ben taking the role of cameraman, they had uploaded these sketches to social media, giving Tim further recognition. Nobody's afraid of AIDS anymore. It's crazy. It's insane. I wanted to know why. I read an article the other day on Facebook, and it said you can live till 70 years old with AIDS. If I had AIDS right now, it wouldn't even be in the top 10 things killing me. I would go to the doctor, and he'd say, well, the good news is you have AIDS. The bad news is your cholesterol is high. The AIDS might help with that. We don't know. Shortly afterwards, with the help of Ben, Tim would launch his podcast, Tim Dillon is Going to Hell, later renamed The Tim Dillon Show. Tim's first co-host was fellow comedian Ray Cump, who Tim met while doing stand-up. And now, Tim Dillon is going to hell! With Tim Dillon and Ray Cump. Tim and Ray had a good rapport with each other, but it wouldn't last long as Ray wanted to pursue his own podcast. So Ben took over as an on-air producer, giggling at Tim's jokes and sometimes interjecting thoughts and comments. Tim's podcast would continue growing in listeners. Coupled with his stand-up on the LA circuit, receiving positive reviews, his name was growing favourably, catching the eye of Joe Rogan. <laughs> The Joe Rogan experience. His first appearance was a success and Joe, obviously being a big fan of Tim, invited him back on 11 times since 2019. This would launch Tim to global audiences. And you don't really hate uh, gay people. No. I don't hate it. I love right. you. Yes. I don't, no, I don't you've hate been, anybody. You've been very good to me. Yeah, I don't Loving ha- me is like go- golfing with Candace Owens and going, I love blacks. <laughs> 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 When the COVID outbreak came and lockdown suddenly became a worldwide reality, there was a blessing in disguise for Tim. With so many people suddenly having extra time on their hands, his podcast became essential listening. He provided hours of entertainment and amusing conversation, which helped so many people take their minds off the troubling time. The popularity of the show can be attributed to Tim's unique spin on current affairs, his wild and unscripted riffs delivered with manic energy, satirising both sides of the political spectrum, as well as his memorable rants about his family and others who have scorned him along the way. Now let's get something straight, you bum bitch. (laughs) Didn't you fake a drug overdose? The fat activist movement came for me Again, you have to have some fucking chair that works, like an actual fucking chair. Throw a beanbag in there, okay? Not everybody's a 90-foot, 90-pound lesbian on ayahuasca that can perch on a fucking birdcage for the whole night, okay? You freaks, listen the fuck up. Talking to you. Get hammered in front of him. Talk about it. Talk about the drugs you do. He won't mind. He'll be doing them soon. He'll be doing them within two or three years. Go take a vacation to Flint. You think you're funny? What, because he said the N-word in the break room? With the burgeoning podcast listeners, Tim would offer Patreon-level bonus episodes for a fee. Many would sign up with Tim raking in approximately 200,000 grand a month. Tim was now accumulating the kind of wealth which he had dreamed of all his life. He started spending on lavish meals, designer clothes, a Bentley and a multi-million dollar home. This has been the, the coolest thing Ever to, it's so surreal to go from the garage making sketches on the iPhone because we didn't have a camera, we didn't have a computer, we didn't have any of this stuff, and, and we still did it. To It's been cool to watch you get successful and famous. It's been really exciting for me, and uh, uh, I love you a lot. That's what I wanted to say. That's if you fair. wanted me to be real, and I, I thank you for everything. Well, and- I thank you. Achieving this success together had been a remarkable journey for Tim and Ben. Their friendship seemed to be based on shared passions, aspirations and an understanding of each other's talents. Tim had reciprocated the loyalty, gifting Ben and his wife a $50,000 wedding present. As much as Tim put on a happy face for Ben's wedding, you can't help but feel he felt hurt seeing Ben in love with someone else. Tim possibly had deeper feelings for Ben unable to voice them for fear of causing further complication, which turned into resentment as despite his wealth, there was something money couldn't buy him. Love. 
Tim has never been able to settle into a stable relationship with a man. He instead pursued a constant cycle of brief sexual liaisons with young men he would meet in hotels. Now approaching his 40s, this vapid lifestyle must play a part in his psyche. In several interviews, he has stated his open-mindedness towards adoption and the importance of family, and even goes as far to suggest that there is something strange about those who lack purpose and connection and reach a certain age without having children. But with this, it appears that Tim's lifestyle is a contradiction. Despite tepid reviews on his stand-up, Tim clung to it, as it was his first love and was a passion that had provided him sustenance for such a long time. Stand-up was no longer his main source of income, and he could not help but feel a certain resentment that his podcast had seen more success and had become his primary source of income. Nevertheless, Tim would continue writing for his upcoming comedy special, which he would give Ben the job of producing. This was the first time Ben had been given such responsibility. After its release, the special received mediocre reviews, leaving Ben feeling partly responsible for his part. This caused further tension on the podcast. Oh yeah, you know, let's talk about this. We should have started the episode with this. Uh, our friend Steve Will Do It's YouTube channel was deleted. And this is really sad. Now, by the way, I know that you and him always kid around with each other and he calls you racist and you go, you're racist. But don't you think that was inappropriate to write on his post? No, that's, well, that's his thing. That's what he does. No, but his, you, his entire livelihood was taken from him today by YouTube. And then you comment, you're racist. It's like not the day to joke. Oh, you're, I, I, you're upset with me? No, I'm not upset with you. I'm just really like, do you, are, do you not understand why that's not the time to make a joke when someone's entire livelihood is taken from them? Uh, I mean, I, get, I, get, I mean, there were millions of people saying, I'm so sorry, that's so fucked. And I just thought if I threw in one thing, it might make him smile. That was all. Yeah, I don't know. Not today. Yeah, I just, it, this is one of those things where, and we, you know, we are all of a different level of social in intelligence. Mm. And, you know, you are. Was he upset? I don't think he was upset. I don't even know if he saw it. I just saw it and I thought it was odd. It was weird. It was, it was, it was not the day for it. Mm. It was not the day to do the joke. That's my he was bad. Very upset about it. not about your comment, but yeah, yeah. about what was going on. You got to read the room a little bit. Mm. You got to read the room a little bit. Not when someone has lost their entire livelihood, you know? Mm. But that's okay. I, you and social cues are not the greatest of friends. You're, <laughs> you live in, the diff, in a town. You see each other occasionally. I mean, you do crazy stuff, too. Not like this. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, can you point a situation out where I've been? I mean, today, like, you in the car, it was crazy. What? I yelled at the woman? Yeah. The woman was walking very slow across <laughs> the intersection and then looked at me and went, what the fuck are you doing? And I was not hitting her. Did I honk at her? Did I do anything? I said, shut up, you fat slob. Because she was starting a problem with me. I did not. She went at me first. But what you're doing is what the, the day that somebody loses their entire livelihood, you are making a joke on their page publicly, calling them racist. People don't know that you and him have an inside joke, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does this look? Bad. This doesn't look good, right? So this is this is social cues. Now, did the woman I yelled at today give us money to do ads on the show? No. Right. So the woman I yelled at today in the car, did I do it on her social media page? No. no. So I just yelled at her and drove away, which sure is crazy, but... When someone pays us money to do ads on the show, they lose their entire livelihood or, or a good amount of it. Mm. It's probably an inappropriate time to make a public joke no, I on get their that. Facebook. Yeah, yeah, right? I fucked up. I'm okay. very sorry. No, it's all right. It's just this is not what we do. These are learning experiences of what we do. That's okay. That's okay. That's all. Because we do care about Steve. We hope that he gets it back, right? Mm. He worked hard. He's millions of views. The hundreds of videos, thousands maybe, all of that work is done, wiped out overnight by YouTube. Mm. And, you know, there, by the grace of God, go us. Like anybody, this could happen to anybody. Mm. It's a weird, arbitrary thing. It was about some gambling bullshit. Some URL should not have been in the video. It was not content related. He didn't go crazy and participate in some cannibalism ceremony. You know, he didn't say anything crazy. You know, it was some, some ad thing. 
So just, I just want you to be mindful of it. That's all. I know you were trying to do the right thing. You were trying to help, mm. right? Just like the kid who puts the fork in the outlet is trying to have fun with the fork. Mm. But that's that's not what we do. Anyway, Tim, now you're mad at me. Don't be mad. I'm fine. I'm fine. Don't be mad. But do you see that it, this is a learning experience? That's why I fucking apologized like okay. five minutes ago. I'm, you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to keep repeating it. It's the third I'm time you're repeating re- it. I'm not repeating. I'm saying that these are this is inappropriate behavior. That's all. And that's all. And I'm I'm happy you recognize that it's inappropriate. Well, the comment got like three likes. So I'm not verified and no one cares who I am anyway. So. That's not true. It's not. The, but see, this is the thing you do where you go, I'm going to now neg myself. I think point. it has like 21 likes. I don't think anyone saw it. I understand. But this is when, when you're corrected, you can't be like, well, no one likes me. No one cares anyway. I'm a big loser. Because what that is, is what you're basically saying is, I don't want to be accountable for my behavior. I'm going to hit myself. I'm going to say that I'm, so it's going to make the person correcting you feel bad. Do you understand? Mm. So that, that's not the way to do it. When someone goes, you point out, you did something wrong, you go, okay, I did something wrong. Instead of going, no one knows who I am. But people, I said that, right? When people care about who you are. Mm. You're a producer of a very big show. People like you and respect you. This is, you know, we, we, this is not true that no one cares about who you are. This is uh, untrue. This is not true. You may feel that way, but that no one else feels that way. People may kid around with you or whatever, but who gives a fuck about those people? They don't really matter. Mm. There's tons of people, Joe Rogan, and all these people love you and think you're great. Um, I just thought it was not the right thing to do. That's all. That's all. But, you know, again, it's just, I, I just, I didn't want to talk to you about, I, I didn't want to talk to you about it publicly on the show. But, but, <laughs> but that's why you did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it came up. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it came up because you brought it up. Because you're the one who talks. Yeah, I mean, it's well, I mean, I, I hope, thank God I'm the one who talks, right? I mean, it, it we, came up. Oh, my God. I mean, it came, it came yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. There's a fucking cue card over there that I wrote. Bring this up. It's It came up, and I thought we should have a discussion about it. It's not a big deal. So hypercritical. What, now, what do you mean by that? Social cues. It Amazing. Was, it was not. Amazing. Was it the appropriate thing to do? You you act so inappropriately in public so many times. Was it the appro- was it the appro- do you justify your bad behavior with my bad behavior? Is that responsible to justify as the great Sean Hannity once said, you justify bad behavior with more bad behavior? If I did that in traffic, would you be okay with it? Yeah. If I okay. You were if you were if I had the right to do it. I was attacked by someone. That's not how it happened. And I yelled at someone. No. But you're deflecting. You're making it about some anonymous woman in traffic who yelled at me and used an expletive. She said, fuck. She used an expletive. After you yelled at her. No, I did not yell at her. She literally looked at me and went, what the fuck are you doing? She said that to me. I was not doing anything to her. I was positioning my car to go when she was cross. She literally said, what the fuck are you doing to me? First. I didn't just yell at someone for no reason. And then as I was driving away, I said, I'm, you're a fucking fat slob. And I just kept going. And when a fat person calls you fat, it's actually funny. It's not even mean. So what you're doing is you're trying to justify your bad behavior and your bad choice by attacking me, which I think is not right. Mm. Is that right? No. It's not right. I just think you should be accountable. That's all. Because Steve's a good guy who's given us money to do ads. I, that's all I'd say. I, I, I don't want it to be a fight. Mm. But you, you're you just going to use this as a reason to hate me and say that I did the wrong thing. And da, 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 da. Hate, hate you. I'm just saying, it's, you, you just, you read the social cues wrong. You read the room wrong. That's mm. all. That's all you have to say. Like, oh, yeah, now I'm sorry. I apologize, you know? I did. That's I all. said it like three times. You, you keep... It keeps going. Keeps it doesn't going. keep going. It you can go back and listen to it. You kept, you, you kept you're, you're, circling back. Well, you, circling because back. you kept bringing up my behavior. You kept going, well, you got in a fight with a woman in the car, and you acted appropriately in public all the time. This is not about me. It's not about me. I didn't do the wrong thing. So when I do the wrong thing, I will go on trial for the wrong thing, but you did the wrong thing. So I think lashing out at me is what why we had to keep going over and over it. That's all. I mean, I have to be hyperly agreeable for it just to keep going. And I wasn't. I was slightly unagreeable. I felt that you did not learn the lesson. 
I was just saying on the day that someone loses their YouTube channel, commenting you're racist, which is an inside joke, it was publicly that no one knows is an inside joke. No one knows. I think I said it on episode once that he not enough that. people know. And it feels like the wrong thing to do. That's all. And I think you know that. And mm. that's okay. So I, I'm not trying to anger you. I did not want to talk about this even publicly. Then why did you fucking bring it up? It came up. You didn't want to, yet you brought it up because while it, we're recording. Because it came up. It came up. And I just thought I wanted to enlighten you. It was becoming apparent that Ben's tolerance for Tim's teasing was dissipating rapidly. On the surface, it appeared that Tim was simply joking around with Ben, but in reality, perhaps there was more of an edge to his behaviour that was veering into more serious waters. This was a definite tension that could be felt, as if the line between banter and provocation had been inadvertently crossed. Then the news came out that after five years, Ben was leaving the show after producing 280 episodes. He posted a statement on Twitter read, Unfortunately, I no longer work on the show as of the last few weeks. I'm extremely grateful. I'm working on some projects now and I'm excited to share them all with you as soon as I can. Tim posted Ben's statement to his Instagram story with the added caption, We love Ben and we're excited to see the new stuff he's working on. Some fans wondered whether it was just a joke by the pair, but it turned out to be true. Many of Tim's listeners were shocked and saddened by the news, saying the podcast won't be the same anymore. After a few snide comments made by Tim and Ray Kump on the latest episode about Ben, some would turn against Tim. Rumours claimed Tim sacked Ben in a moment of anger but quickly regretted it and tried to rehire him, but Ben refused, even after Tim offered him more money to produce the show. Shortly after, Ben made an announcement that he was starting his own podcast with his brother Jay Savory and Devin Costa called Lemon Party. Many of the Tim Dillon Show fans would subscribe to Ben's Patreon in solidarity for the perceived ill treatment of Ben by Tim. I'm subscribing from Tim's Patreon in the process. Do, who's your best friend? Ben. Okay, but, okay. But. Mm, what do you mean? Oh. What happens when there's no pie left, as you would say? When I don't do the show anymore? What happens be when his ben wife finally friends. says, him or me? No, he makes money. He fucks his wife. Does he, how long do you need to fuck someone? 12 hours? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You, you can fuck every night. What it's, is your dynamic with Ben's wife? Is there any tension? We have sex. <laughs> <laughs> they bring me into the bed once a month. Ben is truly the only thing I care about on earth. It's, like, it's very true. Ben is the only thing I care about on earth. Literally, there's a few people in this room and you. I would watch you all burn alive. <laughs> If I knew that I could save Ben, I wouldn't even try to save any of you. To save women <laughs> at the expense... No, Ben is, is my brother and best friend. I mean, Ben is the only person really in my life that I know will stay there forever because we built the thing from the ground up. Also, he has like. Stockholm Syndrome. What choice does he have? He is a beaten man that you have blackballed in the business and said anyone he hires be, him. I know, he could be getting you out of a... Tim did attempt to recapture the same dynamic with new producer Owen Roder from Barstool Sports, but the authenticity wasn't there, with Owen trying hard to replicate Ben's behaviour. Tim would also start dressing garishly to compensate for the show's lack of quality. Despite this, Tim is still making 180 grand a month with his podcast. Buy the shit, please. I'm not going to get less funny. I know, you know what I mean? I'm not going to get, I think some of you think I'm going to get less funny. When I, when I, when I like have a home, when I can afford a house, here's what's going to happen if I can't afford a house. I'm going to kill you. Tim seemingly predicted his future with that statement. As the richer Tim got, the less funny he did become. I wish him well. Can I ask a favor that you please like and subscribe? Because it's a real knife fight out there. It's a joke. I'm on coke. I'm kidding, but keto gives you energy. Let freedom ring. <laughs> Let the wild dog see. Buy a gun and wave your flag. Tell me this doesn't make you happy. If you want to vote, vote. If you don't, just go to the crick and see Jesus.